I remember calling James on the Friday and said, James, we've got 63 people arriving on Tuesday. We don't have a head coach yet. We can't get everyone to Wallingford in the minibuses. Like that's too many people. What are we going to do? Like, what? I know you've planned the sessions and we have a great training plan in place, but how's this going to work? Like one coach for 60 people is a lot. Hey, what is up? Welcome to Last Stroke Counts. Today's guest is the OUBC president, Ella Stadler. Please welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. Thanks for having us. We're the, <laughs> the, the, I've visited a couple of times and never been upstairs. It's pretty awesome. Well, welcome. It's a pretty nice room, isn't it? Yeah, it's a huge boat club in general. Yeah, we're very, very lucky here. Apart from the flooding. Yeah, flooding's not ideal, but it spent... doesn't flood up here. <laughs> yeah, but you haven't spent too much time down here this year. No, I haven't. No, not much time here. Yeah, that's. We'll get a little bit into some of the difficulties of this year. Uh, yeah, for sure. But yeah, I think will be be really interesting. Obviously, spoke a little bit about how you got into rowing. I mm-hmm. think it'd be interesting for everyone else to kind of see uh, how quickly you can go from from not rowing to landing yourself in the boat race. Yeah, I guess uh, that happens. <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah, you, you proved it. So how how did you sort of find rowing in the first place then? Um, I actually tried to start rowing when I was a teenager. Um, so after the London 2012, I was living in the States at the time and was a swimmer and then got injured, came back to the UK, um, just family moved back to the UK and was a bit like, oh, okay, I'm used to swimming six times a week. Like what sport can I do that you have to do lots of times a week? Um, and my dad suggested rowing because he'd done a bit of rowing in his youth and was always like, you're strong. Like you should do that sport. And I was like, oh, whatever. Then eventually said yes because a friend was going to do it. Um, but she was a year below me at school and the local rowing club said I was too old to learn to row. So I was like, oh, that's such a shame because I was 14 and you had to be 13 to do the learn to row program. So I didn't learn to row when I was 14. Um, and then I got my Oxford offer. I mean, during sixth form, I'd like spent a bit, bit of time on the erg. My dad used it for fitness. So he like taught me to erg. Um, and then came to Oxford. I was like, well, it's the thing to do. You know, everyone seems to talk about college rowing. It looks really fun. Also kind of liked the idea that it was a college sport that you could do, but everyone was coming in on a very level playing field. Whereas even like college netball or college lacrosse, like those type of sports, if you wanted to have a good time, you kind of had to be able to do it because other people on the team would be able to do it. Whereas this, I was like, right, I can be a novice. Like they're here to teach me to do it. And that's really cool. Um, and I had a great college coach, B Dutton, who we all love. Shout out. Um, shout out to B, literally icon queen. Um, <laughs> and I honestly didn't do much rowing the first year. I loved the barbecue. I loved um, <laughs> going down to the boathouse and just chatting to B. Like, I think I maybe we would do like 25 minute ergs. We did not do much rowing at all. Nice. Um, and then all through the winter it was flooded. So we didn't do any rowing. There's not many. You don't have many ergs in the boathouse even. Um, no, we don't. No. So we did some weights as well. She would have us do this awful core workout. Um, to what's the song that's like, bring Sally up, brings bring her Sally down. down. And it was that oh. for like a dish hold up to a crunch. And I remember just thinking so many times throughout, like, this woman is so mean. Why is she making me do this? And then be like, hi, B. Like, what's the gossip from the books, girls? Honestly, I think I went to the boathouse most time just to get the gossip and be like, Ooh, who's having to seat race who and she just like tell me this different world that I love to hear about I'm pretty sure that's like most row- that's why most rowers keep coming back to the yeah. sport because it's all, all about their own chat really yeah right? it's just the gossip really <laughs> um and then COVID happened so I went home at the end of second term at the end of Hillary came back September did some remote living room workouts I think I basically lived in a setup where there were four houses and a bunch of, with a shared garden. And we convinced the college to put an erg in this like outhouse building that was a bit sketchy. Um, so got a bit more into it then. Did my first 2K. Um, one of the rooms in the second term, one of the guys wasn't there. And so we were like, okay, we'll put the erg in there and we can just like go in through the back door to use it. And I was really into erging listing, watching, whilst watching TV. So I did my first 2K whilst watching TV not listening to music which is so psycho on reflection um and pulled a pretty good time I think sent it to B and she was like oh okay like you should maybe do this a bit further than just doing college rowing go on 
no i don't remember what it was it was like a 7 30 something but like that's, that's, but I, yeah that first TV. one <laughs> whilst watching tv and at the time what i was like i don't know i kind of want to find it because i remember i would take probably something like that. it was definitely netflix and i remember another time wanting to watch tv whilst erging and i was just doing zone two or something but not wanting to erg for the whole tv show so i put the tv show on like 1.5 speed and all my friends were like that's so rude to everyone that's ever made a tv show like you can't that's like rude to cinema etiquette and i was like i just didn't want to erg for that long like needs must type thing yeah, yeah. whatever it takes yeah exactly exactly um and then that was that would have been january february 20 21 and then in the end of march my friend was costi was doing the boat race and i remember watching that and thinking that's really cool um and then the dev squad signups came and I, it's kind of one of those things where I didn't want to actively sign up I wanted someone to tell me to sign up because I didn't want to admit that I like wanted to try it yeah. or I thought that like if I signed up myself that I'd be backing myself and like you didn't do I don't know I just like wasn't confident enough to do that yeah, yeah. um so Costi was like oh you should maybe do it B was like you should do it and then I was like no no, no actually I need, don't have time whatever because I was JCR president at the time which like junior common room president don't know why i did that but it was good fun organizing um organizing a lot of parties yeah no this was like organizing a massive committee of people who would organize the parties and like welfare events and all of those things so it was like a committee of like 30 do. i know didn't have enough with my degree <laughs> um so i was like add an admin role this theme reoccurs in my life if you might hear later um and then yeah b was trying to convince me to do dev squad i wasn't sold on the idea so she had James Powell, the assistant coach here. Shout out. Shout out. Another amazing person in my rowing life um, who secretly came down to one of our water sessions on the ISIS and watched us row. And I was like, why is this person cycling with B? Like, that's so weird. Maybe it's just another college coach that wants to see what she's doing with her boat. And then afterwards, she was like, so Ella, by the way, James was there to look at you row. And I was like, cool, who's James? <laughs> she was like, the assistant coach at Oxford. I was like, oh, that would have been nice of you to tell me. Um, and then he reached out and was like, basically, yeah, you can't row, but you can't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he really said those words, which he'll probably get annoyed about. But I think the sentiment was that what he told her was, it's not that she rows badly and we'll have to teach her how to row. She just can't row. It's like, it's not that she has the wrong technique. She just doesn't have a technique. So she'll be really easy to teach to row was kind of the sentiment um i also got One told this comment. yeah <laughs> i also got told this halfway through the boat race season when i'd been selected for the blue boat oh, okay. um by another coach who was like uh you've been great to coach because you were so malleable that you knew nothing when you came into this program and i was like i think that's a compliment but no it's really true that. it's much harder to like untrain yeah mistake yeah problems, yeah so yeah. so that was the sentiment and then some of my second year i did dev squad for the first time um didn't do any uh didn't do any racing just because it was like covid summer there wasn't it was all kind of whilst i had exams and then actually started trialing in the 2022 boat race year did about four weeks of trialing and decided to focus on academics for the year was jcr president was doing finals and was also applying for masters and had decided at that point i wanted to stay for another year and like do this rowing properly but I needed to get a first if I wanted to do a master's. So I was like, right, I'm going to have to actually focus on academics right now and do this JCR president thing. Um, so, so that was to apply to, to have rowed in the season that's, we're just at the end of now. No. So I started in the 2022 season. So the 20, the post Olympic boat race mm -hmm. in the 2022 year. Um, and then I was going to applying to do the 2023 season. Right. Um, so yeah, then did a bit of college rowing that year. Um, mainly just trained on my own though, kind of was not really loving the college vibes, <laughs> um, having done dev squad. So I was like, I can go to the gym and do my own thing. Yeah. Um, and then properly did dev squad that next year and really, really loved it. Competed at Bucks. We did a Henley women's boat as well. And then three out of the four people on that boat were then in boat race cruise the next year, which is really, really exciting. So I was in a boat with, um, for Bucks, I was in a boat with Sarah Marshall, who was in the boat race this year and last year with me. And uh, Maria Nielsen Scott, who did uh, Cyrus both years, and also Helen Nielsen Scott was in our Henley Women's crew, who was in the Cambridge boat this year, but Oxford last year. 
Um, traitor. Traitor, yeah. <laughs> Love you, but no. Um, and then, yeah, well, kind of from that point on was like, this is, I'm going to do this. This is really cool. Came back in September, kind of just thought I was going to get cut the whole time. Was just paranoid that I wasn't good enough, which is such a common theme, I feel like, especially maybe in women's rearing, the classic female athlete not thinking they're very good at anything. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, kind of was very lucky kind of taken under the wing of some of the coaches got a lot of support and got in the blue boat that year um and then kind of around february time was like oh, okay i kind of want to do this again and was on a one-year course so it was only really able to do one boat race um and conveniently my supervisor also thought i should academically do a second year of my master's so i was able to switch for two reasons to a two-year course and then i thought okay if I'm going to do this again, I'd love to be president. I've loved doing leadership roles in places I've been, both as a way to contribute to what you're doing and give back to all the things that, like, I feel like if you're benefiting from a program, you owe it to that program to give back some time. And you're definitely giving back some time when you're doing president. Absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, applied for president. Um, Was that just to... Um did you have an idea of like some changes that you wanted to implement or you just wanted to, like you said, give back to the club? Yeah, no, definitely had changes I wanted to make and very, very exciting year with a new coach because it gives you um, lots of opportunity to shape the year. Um, and did you, you wouldn't have known there was a new coach when you started that. So that was no, like that was old. after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So became president early May, mid June. It was announced about Andy. Um, the week I had like a weekend of submitting all of my papers from basically the entire academic year and it was also the weekend of Henley Women's where we had something like 12 boats competing across dev squad wow. and the current squad it was a silly number of boats crazy like really really cool for the club maybe that was across Henley Women's and Henley Royal Qualifiers actually but a lot of boats being raced across a 10-day period and it was also when we found out that Andy was leaving and I remember calling James sat outside the library steps and being like how are we going to train this many crews for the races get them to the races do the races like I can't come and coach I can't drive a launch and James was amazing and he was like even if I'm at the boathouse for 12 hours a day Ella will make it work and I was like okay it's fine like James is here it will be fine and that that thread of James saying it was going to be fine continued a lot through the summer because we didn't have a coach until quite late um that's what you want out of an assistant coach yeah who's gonna step in james is actually amazing like the hours that he puts in especially in summer term like over the weekends he'll be here doing a dev squad session sorry doing a senior squad session saturday morning from 6 45 till 12 45 then he'll do a uh, dev squad session from 12 30 until 6 30 and then he'll come back on a sunday morning and do a dev squad session from 6 45 till 12 45 and then there is a senior squad session but we said he's taking that off so he's there for like 18 hours coaching between the two squads. It's crazy what that man does. Um, but he's very, very dedicated and is an amazing, amazing coach. Yeah. And then did a lot of work over summer about kind of changing planning, hiring a new coach. Um, and then came into this year and made some changes and I'm very happy with how it's gone. Awesome. How did you, how did you start with implementing changes? What, what was it that you wanted to bring into the club as in your new role? Mm. So I kind of started by, I actually chatted to everybody in the squad who'd been in the 2023 season, a lot of coffees, a lot of lunches, um, used all my work breaks wisely and kind of nice. spoke through what they thought was wrong, what they thought we needed to change. And then also chatted to key alumni that I kind of knew through friends of friends, like Costi, um, Lucy Miles, Catherine Maitland, Chitty, a bunch of people like that. And kind of spoke to them about the clubs that they'd been at previously, when they'd been at OUW, as it hadn't merged then, what they thought OUW did well, that we wanted to make sure we were keeping, um, what they thought OUW wasn't doing well, and what they thought they had experienced at other clubs, which OUW could adopt. Um, and from that, I felt like, because I hadn't had that much rowing experience, like I'd basically done one year of full-time rowing, and suddenly I was president of the boat club and wanting to make all these changes. So it was... I wasn't coming from experience of what a good rowing club is like. And I'd had a great year and learned so much, but that doesn't mean it's the right club and doesn't mean there are no changes that need to be made. But I didn't have that awareness of what 
other possibilities there could be of how to run a club or how to function. Sure, but you've been part of like sports course before, like when you said yeah, during true, swimming. Yeah, true. Yeah, and I had done. I'd done a lot of sport before, um, but kind of wanted to gather the options of learning from other people as well, learning their advice. I think it's good sometimes the outside perspective. We yeah. Get a little bit caught up in it. I mean, what would people you say? who have left as well, I think yeah. that's benefit. Like Tina had some great, who was president. Um, the year at the boat race got cancelled had amazing perspectives on. And this is also uh, the year that the boat club was combining. Or was that yeah, so that happened about a week after Andy left. So just in terms of all that was going on, everything. <laughs> my poor family and friends over the summer, summer. Honestly, the hours that I spent on the phone to Louis and the committee and hiring people, it was silly. Um, yeah, so at that point we were going to merge the two open weight squads. Um, but I think we were all aware, kind of, if you're going to do this, do it all in, have the lightweights as well. And so we kind of put the offer on the table to the lightweights, um, and a bit of back and forth. And eventually we got the four squads to merge. Um, but it was also, we're getting four squads to merge, but we don't have a head coach of the women's squad yet. And we also didn't have any lightweight coaches. Those had both left. So we had a coaching team of Sean, Brendan and James for a merged squad of previously four squads where there were previously six coaches and we're now down to three. So it was very stressful thinking it's all well and good us saying now we're going to have this merger and we're going to make these changes of how the merger is going to be implemented. But you can't have the conversations with the people who are going to execute it. And that was kind of hard to imagine it all and piece it all together. And also plan because you're planning for a season but a coach could show up and be like, thanks for all that planning, James and Ella, but nope, I want to do it this way. You didn't even know who was going to be coaching at that time. No, so we conducted interview. The committee did their interviews and then narrowed it down from maybe like 20 to three or four. And then early August, they came to the boathouse here. So I came back from home, came here. Um, and we did a water session. We took out a four with a mix of lightweights and open weights. And we had three coaches who coached us for an hour and a half. And then they had to do like a debrief on how they thought the session went, like analyze, et cetera. And then they had a one-to-one -one, um, meeting with me in one of the other rooms. And you did the one-on-one, the -on -one, yeah. Mm -hmm. good. Yeah, which was really useful. Um, I immediately was sold on Alan. I remember, so they were they were back-to-back -back as well. It was like a Monday evening, a Tuesday morning, and a Tuesday evening. And each one would take about four hours because the session and the interview and I was also moving out of my house that day. It was a busy time. Um, don't like to do things half-heartedly. No. Um, How are you here right now? <laughs> uh, I don't know, but I've got to go write an essay. <laughs> um, and yeah, I remember chatting with Alan and he was the second one I'd been up since 5.30 or something. And I remember going into the interview and thinking, I really hope this one doesn't go on for long because I'm kind of tired and like need to go finish moving out of my house. And we just chatted and it was so great. And you could just tell we were just new from even the first few conversations first few questions I asked that we were totally on the same page about so many aspects of the club and where things were going and were very good at having conversations and being like okay so you think this okay so I think this so we can like amalgamate those two ideas okay amazing we've got this idea and like already it was like okay we actually can't plan a whole club right now because yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to be hired first and like <laughs> there's a fair few hurdles need to jump over before we can actually plan a season um but that was early August but it wasn't confirmed until bank holiday weekend the end of August so I remember calling James on the Friday another moment where I called James in a panic and said James we've got 63 people arriving on Tuesday we don't have a head coach yet we can't get everyone to Wanningford in the minibuses like that's too many people what are we gonna do <laughs> like what I know you've planned the sessions and we have a great training plan in place but How's this going to work? Yeah. Like one coach for 60 people is a lot. Um, and then. It's almost impossible, yeah. Yeah. And then found out on the Saturday it was Alan. Had my first phone call with Alan on the Sunday night. And I remember saying to him, okay, so we've got this meeting on Tuesday morning with the whole squad. It's at 7.30 at the boat, at the um, gym in Ifley. And I'll kind of introduce myself. The head of the committee introduced himself. James will introduce himself. Like, it'd be so great if he can be there. Um, but understand if not, because I knew he had this notice period on his work at Reading Bluecoat. Um, and he had to give three months notice, which is, of course, completely fair. Um, so like completely understand if you have to be there. And Alan said, well, I would love to be there, but my wife's also about to have a baby. Um, her due date is tomorrow. 
uh, if the baby's born, I'll try to be there. But if if not, like I might not be able to be there. And I thought, oh my gosh, this man has a lot on in his life. Like I thought I was busy. He was moving house as well. Yeah, he was also moving house, exactly. Kindred spirit. Yeah, (laughs) wow. We got on well. Um, And then on the Tuesday morning, we met before at like 6.45. And I remember being like, oh, how's your wife doing? Like, is the baby there? And he's like, yeah, the baby was born six hours ago. I was like, oh my gosh, like, how are you here? Like, you should be with your baby. But um, yeah, amazing, amazing man. And really really great to work with do so think, so happy do you think the experience that he's had of leading a women's squad previously for brooks has played a part in like getting him to, to come to oxford like how did he stand out from other candidates in terms of your vision for the club going mm. to the future i think something that definitely <clears throat> something that definitely stood out about alan was when we spoke about a merged club mm. and managing a women's squad alongside a men's squad and i think it's very important as part of a merger and Louis and I have said this so many times this year that we are a merged squad and we work together as Oxford but we also both need to do what's best for our individual squads like there's no point the men doing what the what the women do just because we're merged if it's not going to benefit the men and the same for the women and I think I remember that being very very clear with Alan from the start and lots of conversations about kind of like a women's identity for the club um and just his his vision for a merged women's squad was obviously to work alongside the men, but it was that the women are going to succeed and any way we can help men succeed as well. Great. But the women are going to succeed and that's, that's what we're here for. And I don't think any of the coaches said otherwise. Um, but I remember just feeling like, okay, yeah, that's really cool. Like I trust this guy to really go out there and do it. And we had a lot of good conversations about recruitment and kind of how you I think a big thing was how you manage academic stress alongside rowing stress rowing training stress literally affecting training load and all those things and I think actually his experience of coming from a school was really important for that and knowing in a way that you can't take it like in the school I, I imagine you couldn't have taken people out of lessons and they couldn't have not done their homework and that kind of still applies at Oxford. Like to some extent, people yeah. can list, le- miss lectures, but we do have to move things around. And I think that understanding is really important because um, maybe other programs like around the country, like if you're working and rowing, if you're working full time rowing and working part time, like you have so much more flexibility, and rowing can be the first priority. Whereas yeah. it's a lot harder to do that when you're doing a full time degree. I think you want to bring the most amount of professionalism to any squad you're in yeah but you but you're not working with professional athletes mm-hmm. and i think some coaches get that yeah wrong. exactly and um, they expect you to be there constantly yeah it's just not possible yeah yeah what would you say maybe like you said coming from having done a lot of other sports were there things that you liked that maybe rowing did that you hadn't seen before or the other way around that was stuff that rowing wasn't doing that you thought you wanted to kind of bring mm. so i did a lot of swimming that was kind of like my big competitive sport that's why you had a big ergo to start with (laughs) yeah I had the base engine maybe um and then I got injured from swimming shoulder injury and couldn't swim anymore so became a swimming teacher to try and fulfill that uh and then did a lot of netball and just like school sports then um but nothing to the same intensity in terms of frequency um and I love that rowing would give me the frequency of sessions a week that I used to have from swimming I was kind of constantly itching for that as soon as I had to stop the injury um like a great athlete to have yeah it's like i want to just always train um just love training basically um and yeah i just love to be busy so i loved that rowing kept me super busy the whole time and i love trying to like do my work and the amount of time i have instead of just like sitting in the library for 14 hours a day like that is never gonna be me yeah some people talk about how like how to pair rowing and academics and actually people say you do better academically if yeah. you have rowing because you have less time like you're saying mm. so everything that you have to do is confined into like a small space so mm. there's like no time to procrastinate yeah. or i mean it was a study by cambridge so like maybe we don't love it but um <laughs> they did a study that people participating in university level sport are more likely to get a first yeah. um and i remember that being something but interesting i think costy told me when i was like oh do i have time to do development squad as if i then thought i'd do full squad and president but um i've been told that as well by my university coach uh, up in newcastle but i thought he was just making that up just just no no it's it's definitely like statistically proven um yeah but i think what i loved about swimming and rowing that they both had is like the technical 
minuteness. Like everyone who's had a few swimming lessons can swim across a pool. Everyone can like get in an eight and go down a river, but can you do it to the efficiency level? And I think that's what both had, like both require a cardiovascular base level endurance that you can train for. But if you don't spend the time on the skills, like that's all wasted. That's inefficient swimming or rowing. Um, and I think I really liked that about both of them. I mean, yeah, that's a big draw to a lot of people that row, isn't it? Yeah. My language, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, getting, seeing the power curves and all, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You can get, get so lost in the numbers. And the best thing is there's always something to work on yeah. every day. Yeah. And I think, I think that also means there's, so, because there's always something to work on, you can have, you can feel like you're improving the whole time. Um, and that's like the the positive reinforcement of that. I loved yeah. when I first started rowing. I think that's another thing why people stay rowing so long. Is it's just constant. There's just so many different ways to measure. Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask. I think obviously there's probably maybe not our audience is a bit more rowers and knows a bit more about it. But in general, I think because the race is on the BBC and it's this massive mm-hmm. thing, there's probably sort of a thought that like. You know, down here you've got your fully catered and a hundred coaches and and admin and this and that and yeah, you do have a bowman and things like that. But like yeah. in terms of like talking about how much you've already done as a president, like what kind of is included? What else is included in that role? Like exactly, like if you're helping to interview for coaches and things like that, like on day to day, like how much more involved are you still in it than than a normal than like the regular yeah, athlete? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was actually start. So I've obviously been having conversations with people wanting to be the next president and kind of having those very realistic conversations of how much work does that actually entail or what do you actually have to do um and it's tiny things that I just never thought of like I remember the first thing that landed on my desk was an email from the sports federation for a development plan for the club and what the plan was what the club was doing over the next five years I was like, I, what like, I thought I was just president for a year like why do I need to worry about this um and we're incredibly lucky like we have people I call them like the adults above us that actually manage the finances. <laughs> like we have coaches, we have an admin team, like compared to so many university programs to be president of or captain of, I do have a lot of things that are taken care of by the nature of the boat race. Um, but it's sitting on a committee for the city of Oxford rowing and giving your thoughts on how college rowing is being run and the boat race president the club president between the men and women rotates and they have to chair the meetings for all the college rowers which happened the, the, three the times ARCs. yep which happened three times a term and can last up to three hours at times yeah. um we're talking about swans and how mm-hmm, we need to be mm-hmm. more safe and yep. red flags yep i had a lovely lovely one which was very long um but my approach to those was just like maximum efficiency it was like right any of the questions nope moving on but perfect I love um but even tiny things like that like I was thinking you know how do I get the squad to gel I wasn't thinking how do I fit in the time on three hours on a Thursday evening to get back from training early so that I can run the college rowing meeting like there's so many tiny things that just add up and obviously the media stuff you expect but it's the stuff around the media that takes a lot more time. It's like the documentary this year was obviously so, so cool. But every single time there was an interview, it would take like an hour to set up the cameras and you'd have to let Ben into the venue. Like we did this so efficiently today. Like I had another meeting while she set up. But I don't know, sometimes those things, before you know it, you've lost three hours of your day on a media commitment. And then another three hours in your week running a meeting and WhatsApp, WhatsApp is the devil of this club. <laughs> Honestly, people who send WhatsApp messages, I had to delete WhatsApp over Christmas for two weeks. I was just like, no one is allowed to contact me. You have my email address or my Instagram. Like, do not WhatsApp me anything. Because it's just so instant. And oh, and you just get it and you think you have to reply instantly. You think something has to be actioned instantly and it yeah. doesn't. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that adds up that I think people don't see behind the scenes. And then there's the obvious club stuff, like, Four's head, not all the kit had arrived. So we had to make, sh- well, four's head before we cancelled. We were like arranging who had to swap kit with who to make sure each crew was in the same color t shirts and all those things and finding kit from people from the year before because Rival hadn't delivered the kit for this year and things like that that every club president is going to have to deal with. But ideally, w- ideally, you wouldn't need to. So your role as a president is that kind of like doubling up with like what a regular captain would do also like at the club or you had a separate captain? No, yes, yeah, so you don't have a captain. So I had. 
um, a VP who would kind of help with admin type roles. I'd like an, the odd admin task, yeah. um, a master of transport. So I just kind of like make <laughs> a, a make a committee so I can just delegate to tasks. Nice. So I had Maria who was master of transport who would make sure that all the buses were sorted. Um, or MOT and that. Yeah, exactly. Well, Austin sorts the MOT, but just like, do we have, make sure that you have the keys, that type of issue. Just one less thing for me to think about. Um, social sex, welfare, like there's people there to help out. Um, but we're definitely thinking about what we can do to take more load. I was going to think, the, president. the reason why I'm asking is because obviously as a captain, you already have enough like with people coming to you, crisis mm-hmm. management, putting out fires, etc. If you don't have to also run, run college meetings and then yeah. hire coaches and do all mm-hmm. of that stuff, like where do you have time to train or to even, yeah. like, consider your degree? Like that's what what Tom said, like it's easy to, to see the race on the BBC and think like, oh, it's this massive professional establishment, etc. But like, yeah, I bet you were also like having to like cut sleep short sometimes. Yeah. And the coaches were amazing. I think definitely in the run up to trial eight. So I was definitely struggling with managing the whole, like being an athlete as well as being president. I think at times I put president first, which was definitely the wrong decision because the club will, if push comes to shove, be fine. Whereas like I need to make sure I'm getting enough sleep so I can perform on a day on an hour test or whatever. Um, and remembering that like the club will also do well if I'm doing well as an athlete, just as I want, like I'm trying to make the club run well so that everyone can be a good athlete don't forget that you also need to be a good athlete as part of that um and i think from about december onwards the coaches became a bit more aware of that of the things that needed to take off my load and alan was amazing at just noticing like right ellen doesn't need to do that admin task like don't send that to ella just get it to someone else and minor minor things that do add up I wanted to ask you a little bit about how the trialing process works mm-hmm. for the club and how do you even like come about with the full eight that we see mm-hmm. um, on the BBC? Because obviously you guys start with a pretty big squad and you need to trim it down. Yeah. Talk us through that. Yeah. So we started the season with about 60 people um, and we have pre-season, a bit of our testing in that. Um, and naturally, like a few people once term starts quit, which is fine. Like it's a lot, lot of time commitment. Um and then a bit of selection, probably going October, November, maybe a few people are cut. And then going into December, we have trial dates. And that is two match dates that go, well, now four because of the merger. So there's like an A trial dates and a B trial dates. And it's not necessarily lightweights in the B. Like it's pretty much just the top 16 go into the A trial dates. And then the next 16 go into the B trial dates. Um, and they'll have telemetry on those boats that'll be super useful because it's a full course piece um and i think that was definitely something major that in my first year i was not very high on the rankings for quite a while i was probably like middling sort of um the top 16 when it was the just ouw and then my trial eights i think went quite well and i moved a bit up which helped i think my selection the first year so trial eights is an important one and then of course you've got seat racing Mm -hmm. um and i think the coaches will have a good idea quite early on maybe the top 12 athletes and then beyond that the top 24 and again for the lightweights the top 12 and then it's just finalizing down those last seats probably then the last 10 and then within the last six weeks the ratio down to your eight probably within the last five weeks four weeks down to the eight it's a pretty short season to make all of those decisions. Yeah. In terms of trial aids, mm-hmm. uh, how important is it? For example, if you win your race or what, what is the criteria that like you get judged on? Cause mm-hmm. that's one thing that I never really like, understood about the whole system. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's important to win the race. Like it's obviously fun. I mean, I lost both times, so I can't talk what it's like to win the trial aids. Um, <laughs> well, you made the blue bow. So yeah, yeah. But I made the blue bow with both times. And I think that's quite important is that. I remember the commentary in the first year of trial eights listening it to the bus back and being quite sad that we'd lost. And, you know, like first, one of my first big races, really, as it was so early into the sport, I'd done upper Thames head and fours head and then it was trial eights. And it was really, really cool. And I remember the, um, the commentary talking about the fact that the blue boat was just going to be selected from the winning crew, like not solely, but mostly. And I was like, damn, like as if just losing this race has lost my selection for the year. And then kind of speaking to the coaches afterwards and almost saying like, is that the case? They were like, no, like what? We split the boats into two. So in theory, you'd think four would be in one and four would be in the other, which is basically what we had. Last year, it was exactly four, four. 
And this year, I think it was four and three because one person was injured for trilates. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not about whether you win or lose. It's like whether you put down a good performance, mm -hmm. like what's obviously important. Your slam she's going to be important. I think in most it's for the coxes. Mm -hmm. Um, I think coxing selection is really important from trilates. Yeah. Seeing how the race developed the last two years. So I think coxes play such a big role. Yeah. Uh, Tom, with telemetry on the boat as well, I guess it's, 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 um, you can perform in sort of the sterile environment on the ergo or yeah. when there's no one else next to you, but like, you know, are you, are you going to put it down? Are the watch mm. going to stay the whole time? You know, if it's close the whole way. Who, yeah. Who gives up first? Yeah, exactly. And this year we were really lucky. We had side by side up until Barnes Bridge, which was completely different to the year before. Last year, I think we were separated by probably Fulham football ground. Like it was a night and day different race for trilates. Yeah. Um, it was so useful to have side by side for that long. Like the hole that you can put yourself into <laughs> when your teammate is next to you, but ultimately you want to be that teammate. It's pretty impressive. We had Josh, uh, Bowersman Jones, uh, uh, in our first episode and he was talking about how in those races, because it's such a long course, you can blow mm. and then enough time passes that you recover. Yeah. And then you it's like crazy. <laughs> and you kind of always do a bit because obviously the, like the boat race, the start is, front loaded and you don't blow afterwards but you are like oh wow okay like we're 1k in and i've got 5.8k to go and you feel rough and like you have that buffer that you're gonna go through and then after that you're like okay i can go again like i've got this um whereas i think a 2k when you're at 1k in and you feel a bit crap with that buffer zone you're like well i'm halfway so i'll just keep going yeah um, but the mental side of the boat race is definitely a bit different. Well, that's the thing. Like in the regular head race, if you're racing over like a longer distance, it's who gets from A to B first. But yeah. in the boat race, it's who gets from A to B first, but it also like mm. first you have to break the other crew mentally. Yeah. Completely. You have you have to get ahead. Otherwise, Completely. it's just so hard. Like mm -hmm. if you're a length down or or something like this, it just it, things can fall apart really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, <clears throat> like you talked about, Maybe not, you know, coming into rowing a bit late, not having mm -hmm. the skill that some of the other athletes had, mm -hmm. um, spending a lot of your first year feeling like you were about to get cut or yeah. struggling with that feeling. How would you say, or like, what did you, what did you kind of learn how, how to deal with it? What did you put in place? Or mm -hmm. what did you think about in terms to deal with that? Cause I think we've talked about this before and I think it's an interesting thing. I was saying to Pete the other day, I, spent a lot of my career thinking, God, can I just not be the last person in the boat? Mm -hmm. And then actually when you realize, you, when you're not the last person in the boat, it's not the best boat you're ever in. Yeah. So sometimes I sort of feel like if you can be aware that that's almost a good, as, as unsettling as it feels, it mm -hmm. does mean you're rowing in a squad of people. Better, yeah. You? Yeah. And that's really exciting. And I think it's a weird feeling. I remember talking to Sarah Marshall about this because I mean, she's an incredible athlete, like did amazingly at Gbo trials a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I remember, and she'd done a bit of rowing before coming to Oxford, but we both started trialing the same year. And I remember her saying that she also felt like she was going to be cut the whole time. But we both spoke about this after the season. And I was like, how did you feel it? Like you were probably the top bow sider in the club that year. And she was like, well, but you don't realize like where you are in the standings in, for so long and the, uh, so, so far into the season. Like you just don't really know. You do know a bit what's going on, but you don't want to action. You can probably guess, but you don't want to actually jump to that conclusion, you know, because you don't want to back yourself again. Mm. Um, but I think the second year, I was in a different position because it was president. Um, but it was definitely a lot harder to be in the blue boat this year. It was a lot more competitive. Um, but I think being president maybe gave me a different outlook to selection where I was like, I would love to be in the blue boat, but I'd also love to be the president when an Oxford boat wins for the first time in years and years. And if the way to make that happen is to not, for me not to be in the blue boat, I'd prefer for an Oxford boat to win. And so I was like able to kind of have that step back because I was being fulfilled in so many other ways from this year. Um, and like I was in the blue boat, my boat didn't win, but two out of four boats did win. So, you know, there's a lot to be, there's a lot to celebrate. I obviously would have loved to win myself. Um, you were close, very close. Yeah. And there's a lot to be proud of. Spoken like a true president. <laughs> I prefer for the club to win, you know? I think, I think, I mean, maybe, maybe I would have said different on certain days of the season, but I don't think so. I think I very much wanted, I like was so passionate about wanting this year to be the year where things changed. And I think I felt that from the moment I was president, but also with a new coach, with a merger, like there was so much opportunity 
for change. And it was like, right, let's just make this change count. Um, and that was, you got to win, got to win one race. Like that was all that mattered really. And as well as, as everything we've already spoken about, there are also some significant challenges from this year in general. So obviously not having a lot of water, yeah. some illnesses and injuries and things yeah. like that. How do you go about kind of dealing with them? Uh, are you able to sort of sidestep the emotion and try and get to fixing stuff quickly? Are you working a lot with, with Alan? How, how yeah, go? it was hard. There was like so many hurdles this year. I mean, we didn't have Alan on day one season. We had Brian Young, who was amazing and had been an interim coach before and did an Im- amazing job about being an interim coach and, and like the handing He's over process. Me, yeah. Really? A few, a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he was great. Um but it's it's tough when you then have a transition. I mean, we had the transition from James and I planning to suddenly Brian coming in and then we had another trans and Alan was kind of overseeing the process the whole time, but we then had another transition right after trial eights, kind of as we went away for Christmas break of Brian leaving and Alan coming in and there wasn't much of like a doubling up time. Um and that was definitely a hurdle to get over. We had many hurdles with the merger and just managing dynamics of two different squads now working together um within the women's squad like the lightweights and openweights and it's been beneficial for everyone but naturally there's going to be bumps in the road um and I think those two things were probably harder to deal with because it felt like they were only coming on to me they were only things that I had to deal with um and maybe as I said earlier like it often feels with precedent that you have to deal with it immediately and it's the biggest thing in the world at the mo- at that moment in time when in reality on reflection I probably could have finished the essay first probably would have been good to finish the essay first and then deal with it or like take some time to think about how you're going to deal with it um and then second half, half of the season a, fa- a fair bit of injury faced the squad uh, which wasn't great and flooding was probably the major thing we I was looking back at my calendar. I was writing writing a report for the City of Oxford Rowing Committee. And so I was looking back at my calendar from the last meeting to now and kind of seeing what had happened in the club in that time. And there was a period of about four weeks where we didn't row, apart from going to Caversham for a few sessions. But even then, you're driving there, you're doing maybe 12, 16K on the water and you're driving back and that's five hours of your Wednesday gone which academically isn't great stress minibus drivers spending time driving like it was just exhausting um and it was yeah we didn't get mileage in people also were struggling with injury and therefore couldn't erg and were on the bikes but also not uh, you're not on the water or erging so it wasn't great and that was definitely something that I think the club suffered from this year um and then tide by week people got ill and that wasn't good we had a bus crash yeah, that was not that? something that, yeah, a very, very unfortunate accident um, for Osiris a few days before the race. But yeah, we were pulling up to training. Mitt Blue Boat was driving down Putney High Street and I got a call from Alan. It's like, hi, Alan, how are you? Like giggling away. Um, I think we we're probably playing some funny music. And he was like, you need to get the entire squad into the boathouse and tell them that Osiris had been on a bus crash. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, gosh got good goosebumps thinking about it like how do I deliver that news to like everyone becomes best friends with each other we didn't really know what happened luckily everyone was fine two people had to get checked out apart but it was kind of in that moment of how do I tell all of my best friends that our other best friends are in a bus crash and actually the most important day in our own career is in four days time emotions are high anyways the spares race was the next day Erin Kennedy was coming down to see us and like go out on the launch with us and like talk to us. There was so much going on. Um, and it's weird. I feel like in those moments, like the president head is on, you're like, okay, go mode. Like everyone go into the Bill Mason room and I'm going to talk to you in there. I'm just going to grab a coffee and like compose myself for a moment. And then I'd like take a step away and the Imperial coach is amazing. And he like gave me a hug and it was like, he was like, it'll be fine. Don't worry. And I was like, oh, okay. The fact that someone else thinks that they need to give me a hug means this is actually quite serious. I was like, oh, okay. Like then the emotions hit me and I was like, okay, this is quite bad. Um, was there but, any sense of also trying to keep this quiet? Because yeah. you don't want to sort of give the competitor. I mean, there was a little bit. There was, I think there was a sense of, we weren't going to keep the fact that a bus crash happened quiet. I mean, there's sisters in those boats. Yeah, yeah. So they obviously spoke to their sisters um, and we wanted them to, I think, Sadly, the sisters didn't actually find out through their sisters, which was a shame. Um, it got around the rowing world very, very quickly. Snapchat stories, Instagram stories. 
I had people messaging me from different clubs being like, oh my gosh, I've just seen a picture of a bus overturned. Like, are you guys all okay? And it was all out of like wanting to check in. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say the only part that we wanted to maybe not let the opposition know was that it wasn't phasing us at all. And I remember saying to the, so it was the blue boat, the lightweights and the spares um, that were in the Imperial at the time when I told the news. And I was like, right, we're all going to go get a coffee and we're going to walk down the embankment like nothing has happened. Like this is not going to phase us at all. And we had a talk from Matthew Pinsent that evening that was already scheduled um, that we then rescheduled to the next night for obvious reasons. And he said something in the call, which actually helped so everyone so much that week. And it was that anything that happens, whether it's good or bad, tell yourself that you plan for it to happen. So obviously you don't plan for a bus crash to happen. You don't want your best friends to be in a bus crash. But, you know, the minor, minor thing, like your kit that you're going to wear is wet and you wanted it to be dry. You wanted to wear your favorite kit the day before the race, blah, blah, blah. We planned for it. We wanted this to happen. And just reframing anything bad that happened that actually that was the way we wanted it to go was really helpful because you can't change it. It's already happened and reframing it into something not necessarily positive, but just something that you're in control of was really helpful. That's elite mentality. Right yeah. There. And I think going to think about that so much yeah, we going forward about um, something will go wrong. Right? Yeah. And they're coming to a something, something will go wrong. Mm. And when it does, you're like, oh, yeah. This was it. it. Yeah. This was the moment. We didn't know what it was. Yeah. But here it is. Yeah. You're going to forget something. Something's yeah. going to break. And like you said, reframing it, or, yeah. you know, changing your perspective on it can be like really, really helpful. Yeah. I can't lie. Alan and I also said that. Um, and it was like, something will go wrong. It's the flooding. This year, it's the flooding. And then something else would happen. Yeah. It would be like, okay, so it's, we've just got to have two things this year. Yeah. And that's fine. And then like the next thing would happen. <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh, it, like there's a curse. There actually must be a curse. Um, so yeah, we were quite unlucky with at a bumpy year. Yeah. yeah. I think you guys did really well to sort of overcome most most of that curse. I mean, you've had some success in the squad. Yeah, definitely. So hopefully you've paved the way for the for the next few yeah. squads to come after. What's the sort of like message that you want to like leave to to the people who are going to be carrying on the mission that you guys have started this year to turn the tide? Yeah, I think there's a lot of momentum currently in the squad. I think you're right. Like there was a lot of build up to this year of whether it was going to happen, and I think that maybe made it hard on athletes in the squad in the race that kind of pressure um but i think the tide is starting to turn to use the language of the documentary um (laughs) i think the groundwork has been done i think the big changes that needed to be made have been made um now it's about polishing it off and giving it the time for those changes to have an effect like it's only been basically since january what three months from alan basically starting to us having the race like he started in september but he wasn't full-time until mid-december and then we went away on on like christmas break um so it's basically when we've started in in january for training camp like you wouldn't expect a club to completely change things around in three and a half months so yes we did achieve a lot this year but to on reflection for us to have expected for all boats to go from losing last year to all boats to go to winning this year with all the change that we had to deal with as much as change is exciting like that would have been crazy i also um, think i was talking to someone about that like if it was that easy it wouldn't be worth it right yeah like yeah if you could just do it in three months yeah like, and if it was if it was that easy like you wouldn't get these years of yeah like oxford had their years in like 2012 onwards where they were winning for ages and then cambridge turned around but it took a bit of time i think I, I don't remember what it was, but I think they had a change of coach maybe in Cambridge and they won a reserve race first. And then a few years later, they run, won a women's race. Like it takes time to yeah. be winning everything. Um, but I have a hundred percent confidence that what we've started this year will be what wins everything. I also, uh, we both noticed your, um, your post race comments as well were like so classy. Like, we Thank you. Like that is so- so awesome like, <laughs> thank amongst you amongst everything that's just happened you managed to like, yeah. just put that out it, well, was, like, that's not even something you you would have like practiced because you didn't no. practice like the losing speech no. like, oh, no. i saw we that. that we saw that and we we're like because we, we watched the race live and i was like yeah cool we need to speak to her <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah i mean like obviously i had things that i was going to say i had i had a few scenarios written out of like 
regardless i want to say a few things about like how amazing alan's been like the base work the changes that we've made and like how important those are going to be and like recruit make a recruitment comment and then there was obviously going to be the start of that feedback to the bbc of like win or lose it's going to be different but yeah i remember literally finishing the race and being like do the interview now like i'm not i can't process this until this is done and they were like no we need to do cambridge first and i was like you know, like just don't let the emotions come and yeah. I was with Joe and I, I'd asked Lucy in advance I'd said if something happens will you come with me like I know we, we won't need to but like if something happens and something goes wrong and I have to do a post-race losing interview like will you be with me and she's like yeah of course and jo- when they said Cambridge had to go first we were like all prepared to interview and then Joe like started to process what just happened and I was like no like you are not yeah. allowed to process this for another four minutes we will do an interview and then we will face like everything that's just happened um, and he amazing did an amazing job. So, how did you find the the kind of the media storm in general and doing the filming those kind of things? And as a squad, um, how much of that do you follow, or do you try and kind of stay away from it? Um, depends on the outlet. Some I follow, some I very much try to ignore. Um, some have Oxford leading tendencies, some have very Cambridge leading tendencies. Um, overall, I think the media. The media, I found, in first year, I found it so cool. I was like, oh my gosh, these people are following us around. Like, we're so irrelevant. Why are they doing this? <laughs> but that's really cool for the sport. Yeah. Um, and I, the first year, the BBC kind of like choose an athlete to like follow around a bit. Um, and they chose Sarah and I in the first year. So they like came to, t- came to my house and filmed us cooking dinner and like that type of thing. Um, and I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And then this year, obviously, there were a lot more president specific things. Um, I learned really really good um staring so i can now stare into someone's eyes and not laugh because it has to do that a lot for the president's challenge um <laughs> and then it came to crew announcement and the rest of the crew were like oh my gosh they had a stare into the other person's eye for so long for the filming and i was like that was nothing like you should try president's challenge um and yeah it was really cool and i think it's really amazing to think about how you can use the platform in terms of like women's sport, getting young children to women's sport, like Row 360 gave me the opportunity to write an article for International Women's Day and wrote about like how you need to get more women in sport. And mm. if I hadn't done rowing, if I hadn't done the boat race, I never would have had that opportunity. And that's really cool. Um, and I think at times the media can be a lot, it could be draining, but I just like would try to remind myself, like think about a way you can make this beneficial and not just about the fact that you're being interviewed. Like what's the bigger picture here? what message can you potentially get one young girl to hear and get into sport, whether it's rowing or anything else, um, awesome. which is cool. And like a local primary school, the, who's the physios children go to, is having me speak. And like my local primary school at home had me speak last year, like tiny things like that, or like even doing this, you'd never get to do that if you were just doing another rowing program. And that's cool to be involved in it. But in what way can you actually have an impact with it rather than just doing the interview and talking about yourself, you know? That's the thing is about like, a little bit of love and hate with the media obviously it can be annoying it can get a bit much but without that this race wouldn't be so widely covered yeah it exactly mean so much yeah you know, and like history of it wouldn't be so explored mm, and ben followed us around so much this year for that documentary ben Tufton. yeah and he's great and we did a lot of work together and a lot of um him trying to get me to like say say something again he's like all right that's good say it again but can you like intonate it in a different way and i i'm okay like doing an interview but i'm not i'm not an actor like i can't say a specific line if you want me to say it so that i struggled with but again it's like without that they wouldn't have got as many people to watch on the bbc without that many people watching the bbc we wouldn't have the same funding and that's why the race is what it is and i think the women's i don't know the statistics from this year because we haven't had the analysis yet but the women's race last year the it was the second most watched women's sporting event out of the whole bbc coverage like it was only second to the lioness matches wow like that was their final the lioness final match and we were the boat race like we were just a bunch of people who were rowing down the river like that's crazy that that many people tuned in to watch it um that must feel good kind of scary though (laughs) like i think now that i won't be doing the race again We'll see. No, I won't. <laughs> no, no, I won't be doing it. Unless someone wants to sponsor me to do an MBA or a D field, but we'll see. Well, it's out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if someone Instagram wants to, guys, on the page. I'm going into sports consultancy, so maybe I should do an MBA. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so yeah, but now that I'm not going to do another race, um, <laughs> I think I can. I don't believe you. 
We'll see. <laughs> um, now that I'm not going to do the race, I can start to see the impact of how crazy it is to have that many people watch you. Whereas I think in the build up to my first race, especially, I didn't want to notice yeah. it. This year, I made an active effort to like take it in a lot more. In the start, on the start, I like looked around and like was like, okay, I can, I can see all these crowds and like not like relish in at all because that's like so up yourself. But you know, I want to remember this. I want to, and I heard Costi like mentioned so many times was actually on one of the big boats near the start line, just with a bunch of alumni like talking to him about her experience of the race and I heard her shout like go Ella or something like that and I was like okay like Maybe. this is really cool like I'm gonna remember this day whereas I think the first year I remember just being petrified like complete yeah. tunnel vision didn't want to acknowledge that there were people watching at all didn't hear any of the crowds anything like that so it was cool to be able to do it twice to make sure that I could take it in mm-hmm. but I think watching it next year I'll definitely probably be like oh my god gosh a lot of people watch this race like wow that's kind of scary that i did it um i'm glad i don't know the full scale of how many people watch it yeah that's a good point though in terms of like what it's like to do the first time and how yeah, you can get completely more different. It, how you can use that energy mm. as fuel for the fire yeah. as opposed to like getting you more nervous yeah um, i think the first year i found it gosh that's just scary because what if i mess up and that many people are watching whereas this year i was like that's so cool that this many people are interested in something that i just do because i love it yeah. I think that's the difference. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's the key point. It's like you're here because you love it. Yeah. Like it's not for any reason. Not here to be famous. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you definitely don't do this sport <laughs> just because you want to do it. Like you better put in the hours. You wouldn't be putting in the hours unless you loved it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I was going to say like you've done the race a few times now. In terms of um, the model that is important to succeed how much of, of a role do you think in terms of recruitment mm. technical ability plays versus like being a very good endurance athlete versus a power athlete because obviously some people might think oh, but it's a 16 minute race i could come to oxford 21 not- this year well true <laughs> yeah but i could come to oxford but like i'm not big enough but like so h- how much of a space there is in terms of squad for people with like that bring different abilities to the table yeah definitely um I mean, the training program develops you for the specific race. So you might have come from a program that is a 2K race. And if there's someone who's done the boat race before, like on day one, they're probably going to be more prepared for you. But by day 187, whatever it is of the season, you're all going to be on the same level playing field and you're going to be prepared for it. And I mean, now, especially that we've merged, there's so much opportunity for athletes that have maybe come from a lightweight program before and want to make the step up, but like a kind of, doing that transition and maybe they do the first year in the lightweight program and then the second year they step up and the third year they do the blue bit like that type of thing there's way more space for that progression which is really really exciting it's good in terms of mind games you yeah. had two sisters on either side of the race this year mm-hmm. how like tom and i were speaking about this we would be definitely trying to feed some false info or some misinformation through that channel like how much of that did you <laughs> so um Maria was on the team last year and so was Helen and so we knew them as sisters and obviously knew Helen really well um and it was funny seeing her like on the tie for the first time whereas Catherine is on the Oxford team this year Gemma I met both of them at um like home international trial stuff last year um and like spoke to them and at that point Catherine was coming back from injury and she's like oh yeah I'm gonna trial it was really exciting but key to note is that Maria is a massive prankster and just loves playing all kind of possible pranks so we would didn't i don't think we ever successfully managed to start any rumors but we love to just like make up a story and then she would see, feed it to helen and see if it would like get out but i don't think anything really worked and i mean they're obviously sisters and they're gonna chat but they're also at a university and they want that university to win so that I don't like I'm sure there was no secret spying or anything like that but we did talk about different rumors that we could make up Go and on. be like I think one of them was like Lucy has a 604 2k like ridiculous <laughs> things like all these things that we we're gonna say or like um we we're like oh we're gonna we're actually gonna swap some on sides like right before the race just to see how they react or like silly things like that but th- we did hear that in, in December it came back to us from someone from Cambridge came to us within the, through the sister network and said that apparently all of Oxford are going out partying. And like, we hadn't at all. We were like in a training block that meant we were not going out. And we were like, where are they getting this from? Um, fly. Yeah. In their own world, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like Oxford party girls. Um, no, we did come up with some ideas, but I don't think we ever executed them. Like, mm-hmm. they're our enemies. They're Cambridge, but like, 
the institution is an enemy, not the people. Mm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, and then I guess then, so what do you think is going to happen for you in the future in terms of rowing? Do you think you want to keep rowing? Could you see yourself trialing or anything like that? Or do you think maybe you need a break? Um, I'm really sad to not be here next year. I need a break from Oxford academics, which therefore means I have to take a break from the boat race. Um, I'm going to go traveling next autumn, this coming autumn. And then I have a job starting in January in London doing sports consultancy which I'm really excited about. Um, But if I would love to do a defil at some point, basically my research, what I really want to do it on, the documents haven't been released yet because it's like a 30 year archive rule. So I'd love to come back at some point and do a defil, whether that could be before I turned 30 so I could do another boat race, who knows? Um, Or whether I'd be interested in doing like a one year MBA or something like that so that I could progress my career more. We'll see. Um, but I'm not ruling out that I would never do another boat race, but the situation would have to be right because I don't have an academic pathway that is natural for me to do another one. Um, but I also will be tempted by London rowing, I think, like going to Thames or something like that. Um, some of the good clubs down there. Is there any chance that, uh, someone could offer you a light blue membership and you'd take it if it meant doing another boat race, but for the opposite side, or that's something that you categorically rule out? So I write, people, we all like play these scenarios through because there are people that are swap sides. And I think the only way that I could row for the light blues would be if Alan, James and no current teammates were still at Oxford. I think I wouldn't be able to row against any of them. Yeah, that's a good Especially one. like James was my biggest one. I was like, I just couldn't. So when I was applying for masters, even then I hadn't even properly rowed for the club, but I was like, I couldn't. James is the one that's got me into this sport, him and B he's the one that's really taught me how to row in the development squad. Like I couldn't do it to him was my main thing. Um, so if they had all gone somewhere else and the club was completely different being run by different people, maybe I would do it, but I don't see that happening at all. I think that's a, that's a really, really good answer. Good answer. So, I guess we just got some quick fire round questions to, okay. out of all the rowing venues that you've trained at, raced mm-hmm. at or visited, what are some of your favorites and why? Um, I rode on the river in Florence. It was really cool. That's in Italy. Yeah. Uh, just on holiday, was travel- interrailing with my cousin and went down to a rowing club and was like, can I go on out a single? They said, yeah. And no swim test. No swim test. <laughs> no capsized drill. <laughs> um, and then um, when I was in Austria for my cousin's wedding, my dad and I went out in a double in this beautiful Austrian lake um, that was crystal clear water. And that was amazing. Was it amazing or was he like, were you telling him what to do? Was he the <laughs> uh, it was the night, we'd just come from a night out um, and he was rather hungover. So it was managing the training load was important that morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. If you were to repeat one race or event when you're 60 or 70, what would it be and why is it up a Thames head? <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, it would be the Vets boat race. Nice. Okay. That would be a good one. Yeah. Why? Do you want to know why? Um, so I can finally win one. Um, ouch. Um, no, I think I wouldn't do Upper Thames Head. Fours Head, maybe? Do they do a Vets Fours Head? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, maybe Vets Fours Head. Fours Head was a cool race. Um, or Head of the Charles. That's been on my bucket list. Never done it. Oh, yeah. So that's not a repeat race, I guess, but sorry, that wasn't a very quick answer. My quick answer would be Vets Boat Race. (laughs) Vets Boat Race. Quick questions, not quick answers. Yeah. Yeah, I like the long answers. What about things like um, Henley Women's or Henley Royal? Mm. Oh, I loved Henley Women's. That was, apart from Bucks, that was kind of my first proper race and I had a lot of love for that, Um, but I haven't actually done it since, but hopefully going to do it this year. Um, You can do it with terms. With Thames this year. Oh, is it I could in future years? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could. You're right. Um, yeah, great races. Love, love Henley Women's. Hope it continues for years to come. Uh, ask the question if you could go back to when you first fell in love with rowing, what advice would you give that person? Um, these aren't the worst blisters you'll ever get. (laughs) (laughs) Um, eat enough because I definitely didn't do that. Um, just because you have to get up for a or- morning outing doesn't mean you get less sleep, go to bed earlier. 
Um, yeah, good. Mm. And do a lot more training through the summer so that you're a bit fitter when you come back for pre-season. Very practical advice. I like yeah. That. And also, not stuff that we've heard before. No. Who are some of your rowing idols or people that you've looked up to during your career? Ooh. I feel like I was in a weird place with rowing where I kind of knew no one or like, you know, the whole like be a student of the sport. I wasn't very good at that. I wasn't very good at like watching old races or anything like that. Mm. I feel like I've had a lot of conversations with Matthew Pinson just about being president, being at the club, kind of all he's learned from his previous years. Um, kind of older athletes at the club, I think. Tina Christman, Christman, I think you say her name. Um, love speaking to her and just kind of like her transition from other sports away from rowing um i mean some of the gb women's team are incredible athletes to look up to becca shorten like watch her technique a lot um but yeah i think in terms of the current rowing that i've been doing thinking a lot about matthew pinson and like his outlook to being president and being athlete i think i spoke to him a lot and thought about his advice a lot it's good it's very good i've just got one last special question since you've mentioned that uh you've run some college meetings yeah do you also think the biggest legal risk you can ever take is cycling on the oxford towpath yeah yeah <laughs> if you've been in one of those meetings you do yeah yeah I, I do um and if you were to not wear a helmet whilst doing so good luck <laughs> <laughs> oh that's cool out that's uh it, yeah, they because they didn't have tour pits this year, did they? So no, they the didn't. First, They've first got bumps. It's going to be fun. yeah. But I think it's still summer eight. So I think it's, it's not the summer funky summer tour pit stuff. It's going to be carnage. Yeah, That's what it's going to be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like people do literally haven't rode at all because it was just an yeah. opportunity to. Yeah, I can confirm having done that. It's carnage. <laughs> having been that person that's never really rode before in summer eight, it's carnage. Are you 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 going to race the show? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Still trying to like finalize OUBC commitments versus summary its commitments but I'm gonna get you to stroke uh I don't know maybe we'll see <laughs> I think so in my college it's me Maria who was in Osiris and was stroke of Osiris so maybe if we bow rig it that would be good um and then Hattie who was in training with the blue squad this year um and Georgia who did some lightweight stuff last year so it's pretty stacked boat yeah Cool. Watch out, whoever we're chasing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't checked. I haven't it. checked Ox bumped recently. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, I guess since your your tenure as a president is coming to an end, yeah. what's like the final message that you want to leave for the club? I know it's a bit of a cliche question, but yeah, my, the message that I want to leave for the club or about the club. Your choice. Okay. Um, maybe about the club for people considering it is just thinking about how exciting it is to be in a club that's making those changes and that is really, really like on this crazy trajectory of improvement um, and like join it to be a part of it. Um, I remember speaking to a few people at the start of this year who were on the fence about coming back and it was like, you're going to want to be a part of this year. And I think they're so glad they have been a part of the year that we can say we've really made a change and like, yeah, we didn't win the blue boat race, but that's not really like you don't set out the season for one boat to win you set out of all boats to win so for two boats to win that's still really good and then maybe for the squad is just like how amazing it's been to be president like it's been such an honor um i've loved being a part of it and through all the hard moments that they're going to have in the years to come like take them all in because when you don't have any more left like you'll be really sad very well said that's really really nice yeah cool i think that's that's basically it thank you so much for for coming for having us today thank you for having it's, me it's been really yeah it's been really fun to chat and yeah, yeah really looking forward to what oxford's gonna do in the future yeah really exciting times thanks guys yeah thanks appreciate that and then i think on that note that concludes everything for this episode so easy there cue the music